How's your day so far? Yeah, good? Yeah. Um, well, just a moment ago, um, one of the volunteers came to me. She paid the greatest compliment to me. And she asked me if I wanted to have my photograph taken. Because <laughs> she thought I was the plenary speaker. So thank you very much. <laughs> um, well, if any of you would expect me to introduce someone in Cleon this year, will be hugely re relieved or disappointed because I'm not going to. Uh, instead, I'm going to introduce to you Sylvia Karastathi, who's a lecturer at uh, New York College, who is going to introduce someone. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Sylvia Karastathi. Hello, uh, good afternoon, uh, welcome. Dear TESOL members, uh, dear colleagues, before I introduce our second plenary speaker for the 37th TESOL Greece con con Conference, I would like to take a minute uh, and thank the TESOL board, and in particular this year's chair, Suzanne Antonaris, for continuing the excellent cooperation that New York College has built over the years with TESOL Greece. New York College has developed strong links with the language teachers community, not only in Athens and Thessaloniki, but also in Prague and Tirana, where it has established private universities, but also in New York, London, Manchester and Toulouse through our academic partners. The Department of English Language and English Language Teaching of New York College, in recognition of TESOL Greece quality contributions to the promotion of language teaching, has been supporting its activities with a number of initiatives, such as hosting events at our premises in Athens and Thessaloniki, providing uh, scholarships for TESOL members for a number of bachelor's, master's and PhD programs, which we offer in collaboration with the University of Greenwich. And finally, and this is why we're here today, with spo sponsoring speakers who are leaders in their subject area for the TESOL annual conventions. One of them, is today's plenary speaker, Mr. Jeremy Halmer, who is one of the most influential ELT writers, presenters, teachers, and trainers. His books, How to Teach Writing, How to Teach English, The Practice of English Language Teaching, and the prize-winning Essential Teacher Knowledge, published by Pearson Education, have been taught to university students across the world. What many of us perhaps do not know so well is that Jeremy Halmer is a performer of poetry, prose and music and has recorded three CDs. His new work for narrator, soloist, chorus and orchestra was premiered in 2015 and he's frequently uh, he's, um, in frequent demand as a narrator and a spoken word performer. On behalf of New York College, it is my great pleasure to present Jeremy Harmer. That was so exciting. That was so exciting that I dropped my um, thing. But Sylvia, thank you so much. And, and a, a special thank you uh, from me to TESOL Greece. This is, I was trying to work it out, either my third or fourth visit to TESOL Greece. Fourth. fourth. I think it's fourth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and it's, it's, just, it's just the most wonderful uh, conference to come to. Um, so thank you, TESOL Greece, for the invitation, and thank you, New York College, for the sponsorship. I have the great pleasure on Monday of going to visit New York College, and I, I'm, I can't wait. It, I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, before I start, I should also probably explain the rather strange title that, that you can see there on the screen. It says, um, it says IATEFL International Goodwill Ambassador. Uh, and, and most people, many people, uh, in this audience will know what IATEFL is. Just in case you don't, it stands for the International Association of Teachers of English as a Foreign Language. And two and a half years ago, the then president of IATEFL, Carol Reed, sitting over here, uh, um, got in touch with me and said, would I be uh, an international goodwill ambassador for IATEFL? And I, I was very excited by the idea. My mind instantly saw I don't know, beautiful children in exotic locations and, 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 and at least private jets and, and champagne. And who knows, maybe even a press conference with Angelina Jolie. I just, I just, I, I just, 
And I said, so, and, and so I said, what's in it for me? And she said, absolutely nothing. Because <laughs> uh, she's, she's cruel like that. But, but of course I said yes. Why did I say yes? Because IATEFL for me, this UK uh, institution, is family. Uh, it's got thousands of members, but if I tell you that my membership number is 67, uh, you'll get some idea of, of how important it is in my family life. Um, I'm completely humbled to be standing here talking about it in front of two past, past presidents of the association, Carol Reed and Alan Maley here. Um, it's just one of the great teaching organizations in the world. Uh, and it's increasing international uh, uh, connections, membership, makes it a thing of great beauty and joy. And it has the most wonderful annual convention. Not as good as TESOL Greece, obviously, <laughs> but, 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 but it's a great uh, convention. Five plenaries, 250 workshops, uh, um, celebrations in the evening, good fun and everything else like that. But what reason, and of course I would tell you about it because she said I had to and she's kind of scary. Um, um, but, 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 but there's another reason for telling you, of course. I know that many people in this room will be with us uh, in a few weeks in Birmingham for the 50th conference. And all I can say is I can't wait to see you there. But if you can't be there, and this is why it's worth talking about now, if you can't be there for reasons of whatever, time, family, money, you can still be there. Because for the last few years, IATEFL has gone seriously online. And all you have to do, all you have to do to be there is to go here and you will find out instructions of how to watch many of the fabulous presentations that there will be in Birmingham online. And you can come to our wonderful annual conference for free. And, and we think that's great. And, and, and so for the last two years, I'm coming to the end of my ambassadorship. And so for the last two years, uh, this is what I've been doing, Carol. So, um, mission completo. See? And I live and the left word. Okay. There was a, okay, enough. Right, that's that. Enough of that. Let's get on with the business in hand. The subject is, can students learn by themselves? Um, let me just explain. About a year ago, a year ago, um, I went to, uh, to a country to do some work. And on my first evening, I rushed to take an iconic tourist photo. And this is the photo I took. Uh, I said, this is the photo I took. There we are. Um, now, uh, this is a very, does anyone know where this is? Um, it, by the way, every night on sunset, you'll always see them. Here they are, the, the young lovers. They sit on the seawall. You don't know where it is? Uh, well, you know where it is now. It's in Cuba. And I was working with teachers in Cuba a year ago. And um, we were having a discussion about this, that, the other. And there were lots of teachers there, and, 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 and they wanted to take photographs of me because they thought I was George. And, um, and, and, um, and, and so they wanted to take photos. And of course, there were lots and lots of selfies. And here's one of the selfies that was taken. Uh, there we are. And please excuse me for giving you this big picture of myself. But the guy, um, the guy uh, on, the, um, on the left is called and, and, um, Rancel, his name is Rancel. Uh, and here's Rancel at his place of work at the Universidad Agraria de Havana. Um, why am I telling you about Rancel? We were all sitting around having a conversation about stuff. You know, work workshop, teacher's workshop about learning. And the question came up about, you know, whether learner autonomy is, is a myth or not. Uh, can students learn by themselves? And Rancel piped up. He said, me? He said, me? I said, what, Rancel? What? He said, well, when I was 11, he said, when I was 11, um, I got obsessed with this computer game, this, well, not com a video game. I don't know where he got it from because technology in Cuba is not a big deal. But anyway, uh, this, he got obsessed with this video game. His problem as an 11-year-old was that the video game was in English. So he was desperate to play this game. So I said, well, what did you do? He said, well, I taught myself English. <laughs> so the answer to um, can students learn by themselves is yes, and that's the end of this talk. But of course, it's not quite that simple. Yes, of course, students can learn by themselves. There are people in this audience who pretty much learned English by themselves. There are people like Rancel all over the world. There are autodidacts who get this obsession, this passion for learning English or Russian or French or Greek or Turkish or whatever it is. They get this passion and they learn by themselves. It can be done. And we know it can be done because people have tried to base sort of commercial riches and wealth on it. Uh, older ones among you might recognize what that is. 
Ah, oh, you see, that, that you're not that old. Don't be ridiculous. Um, for those of, the, those of you who are younger, this is a box which used to be full of round, circular black objects, which you put on a turntable, and, and, um, and you learned how to... And, and the record, the record would play you. It would say, now repeat after me, and it would say in Greek, I don't know how you say it in Greek, where's the station, and blah, blah. How do you say where's the station? Sorry, one at a time, please. Can you say again? We know stuff of us. Okay, so I'd listen to that again and again, and then I'd say it. And, then, and linguaphone, lots of people learn languages with linguaphone, listening to these records going round and round. When I say lots of people, I mean a very, very few people. But some people certainly learn languages with linguaphone. But then when we moved on, we come on to something like the Rosetta Stone. And the Rosetta Stone allows you to learn a language on your own. And, and lots of millions of... Some people do. <laughs> but, but of course, they, 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 this is revolution, re-evolution, air evolution. Uh, what's happening now? Well, the danger is, by the way, the danger is this is the last ever TESOL Greece conference. This is the danger. <laughs> Why? Because of this stuff because of adaptive learning. Now, I've put up a picture of El Guapo and Mr. Philip Kerr here for a reason. If you don't know who Philip Kerr is, well, there are many things to know about him. He's a fantastic writer, a great trainer, and stuff like that. But he, but, but excuse me, where did you come from? <laughs> he is not a horse. Um, uh, but he has written this blog called Adaptive Learning and ELT. You really should read it. What's it about? It's about companies like Duolingo and Newton. Does Duolingo mean anything to you? What does Duolingo promise? Well, basically, Duolingo is software which allows you to learn a language all by yourself. By yourself. So the point and the reason that adaptive learning is a big challenge to you and me and all of us in this room is that adaptive learning does something that Linguaphone could never do and Rosetta Stone could never do. And it's this. It adapts to what you are doing so fast in nanoseconds that it actually it can probably deal with you better than any teacher can. In other words, what it says is the computer can actually measure how many times you have to do this word again, which words you've done, even the pressure on the mouse, how many seconds it takes you, how many nanoseconds it takes you to, to go from here to here to here, and it will then adapt what it gives you on the basis of what you've done. And the claim, of course, is that it can do that better than a teacher and more individually. Because teachers, we sort of do what we think is right, but we may get it wrong. Our judgment may be wrong. The computer is never wrong. Uh, discuss. Uh, um, the computer isn't wrong. The computer can, in, can react to what you do in two seconds flat, just like that, in actually 0 0.0002 seconds flat. It can do it just like that, adapting to what you're doing. Absolutely perfect. And so that, and, and so that oh, by the way, uh, in case you think we're talking futurology, well, have a look at what modern testing looks like. Modern testing if you think of, of uh, TOEFL, if you think of the Pearson test for academic English, who marks the compositions? Who marks the free speaking? Computers do. Computers now mark free writing and free speaking. Why? Because the claim that is made is they are marked better than they are ever marked by mere humans. And we were talking about uh, testing and creativity and about rater, I don't know where George is, but about rater, about rater reliability and stuff like that. Well, what the people who do computer testing say is computers are more reliable. You know about computers? Computers don't, fi computers are faster at marking tests. They don't get tired or bad tempered. They don't have one glass of wine too many which will cloud their judgment, and they mark everyone exactly the same, exactly the same. And they're more reliable, and all that kind of stuff. And, and they do it through all sorts of complicated algorithms and stuff. So there's a slight danger that, as I say, this is the last ever TESOL Greece convention, because we are all going to be replaced by machines. No? no. What was that, uh, prophecy or wishful thinking? <laughs> uh, um, but actually, but actually, funnily enough, Funnily enough, funnily enough, I think I agree with you. Uh, why do I agree with you? Well, I sort of agree with you certainly in the near distance because 
Rancel learnt English by himself, but there aren't many people in Cuba who learnt English by themselves. And there are 11.5 million people in Cuba. And there aren't that many people in this room who've learnt a language by themselves, because to learn a language by yourself takes an extraordinary commitment, a, 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 a huge uh, passion to get you going, and some kind of staying power. And I don't know about you, but it's, it's a bit like going to the gym, you know? Going to the gym for two weeks is easy, but it begins to tail off around week five, doesn't it? And then I must go, I must go, I'm paying a monthly, I must, oh, it's just, you know. Um, you what? The diet is a diet. Is it? Yeah, and the problem about going to the gym is, uh, anyway, we're not talking about going to the gym, we're talking about learning English. Um, 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 because, because the problem about learner autonomy, which we all, everyone here knows that if we could get students to learn by themselves, and if we were responsible for, all, for getting them to learn by themselves, then we would think that we had done a really good job. Don't you think? Because on the whole, if I could help you to become an autonomous learner of English so that your English could get better and better and better, then I've done something which I can look at myself in the mirror and say, I've done a good job. What a good thing I've done. I've actually helped you take the reins, horses, take the reins of, of this thing and become an autonomous learner. And, and, and we have this image, don't we? We have this image of our students kind of breaking free from us uh, and, and, and leaving our harboring arms and, and rushing off into the, into the sunrise. Uh, um, with joy in their hearts and their ability to learn English. But for everyone in this room, which is all of us, who's tried to get students to learn by themselves, the old English saying works really well, doesn't it? Horses, what? Horses and water, what? You can lead a horse to the water, but you can't make it drink. So the real question... Uh, so the real question then is, yes, you can take the horse to the water, but you can't make it drink. I'm sh is there a Greek, Greek equivalent to that, to that um, metaphor? Okay. <laughs> what does it mean? You can't go, well, you can. Here's my shotgun. <laughs> but yes, isn't it funny? This is, Sylvia, this is your territory. Isn't it funny about metaphors, how different people do metaphors, you know? Um, I think uh, most countries seem to have the, the sort of wolf in sheep's clothing. It's an idiom. Uh, um, most countries have wolf in sheep's clothing. Uh, does any other country have the straw that broke the camel's back? Yeah, almost every country in the world has, it's the last drop of water which made the glass overflow. That's Spanish, all the Spanish. But the straw that broke the camel's back is sort of uniquely, um, it's, it's sort of Dickin, Dickensian, yes. Um, uh, oh, yes. So, I don't know. I've, um, so, you can lead a horse to the water, but you can't make it drink. So, what this talk is all about, is, is now for the rest of the talk going to be about, is how to make... Um, horse is really thirsty. Uh, uh, because if you do that, we've, we've won the battle. Now, this conference is all about our evolution. And as you'll see, we're moving towards that. Uh, by the end of the talk, we'll be very much in that territory. Uh, the first one I talked about, of course, was, was this whole business of, of adaptive learning and whether computers can actually replace teachers, uh, more to the point, replace students in classrooms. Uh, uh, as, as the best mode of learning. And so far, they've signally failed to put up a very good case, in my opinion. And actually, if you look at most adaptive learning, it seems to rely very exclusively on a kind of rather old-fashioned kind of audiolingual uh, um, trope uh, to sort of make it work. We'll see. Uh, I'm no kind of um, prophet, and I may be completely wrong. But what I want to suggest now is that uh, though it is maybe impossible to force students to be autonomous learners, still you can make them thirsty. Uh, here goes. Uh, how do we do that? Well, well, the first thing we do is, is to remind students all the time that it's all about you. It's all about you. It's not about me. It's not about the course book. It's not about the teacher. It's not about the syllabus or those pesky exams or anything else like that. It's all about you. This, everything we're involved in is about you. 
everything we're doing in this room, this group of students. It's about you. How do we do that? Well, we do it through all sorts of, uh, Carol was talking about choice. Uh, uh, one of her seven pillars was choice. And, and choice, every time you get students to choose something, what you're saying to them is this is about you. It's not about me or the syllabus or anything. It's all about you. So for example, here's a very simple example. Um, here's, a, here's, a, here's a word list uh, from the end of a unit of a course book. Uh, now, what happens usually to word lists at the end of a... What do you do, you personally, uh, if you're using a course book, what do you do with a word list at the end of a course book? Tell me what you do with it. I, that is the most honest answer I've heard. <laughs> most, most people, if, they, if they're honest, acknowledge that what they do with word lists at the end of course books is absolutely nothing at all. Nothing, absolutely nothing. They sit there, they're a waste of ink, they're a waste of paper, they're a waste of space, wordless. Maybe some students, the really keen ones, but they're all called Rancel, so it doesn't matter. Maybe the keen ones start writing in sort of Greek translations and doing whatever they do. But all we have to do, all we have to do is make students thirsty. So we, this is a silly little, little, little example, but it's an example. All we have to say is, you're going to be stranded on a desert island. We had a desert island. Who was it? Was it Carol or was it, or was it uh, Marisa? Uh, uh, we, we, um, we, um, you're going to be stranded on a desert island. And you can take five words from this list. Which five words are you going to take? Which five words are you going to take? Give me a word. Which word you, give me a word. Which words are you going to take? Museum. Why are you going to take museum? Who said museum? Go, Sylvia. Why are you going to take museum? She wants to live in a museum. Okay, there is slightly weird, but that's okay. But, <laughs> but, but yes, take, which word are you going to take to this holiday. desert? Holiday. Why are you going to take holiday? I need holiday. I need a holiday. We all need a holiday. Tisol Greece is a holiday. Um, but, but yes, so it's a silly example. It's a very silly example. Except it's not silly because underneath, it's, it's rather more profound than that. Because what we're saying is it's all about you. Which word would you like to take to a desert island? Uh, yes, I know it's a sort of game. We talk about play. It's a sort of gamey thing. It's a little game-like. But it, just the fact that you look at a group of English words, which are the kind of words that the teacher throws at you all the time, because that's what language teaching is all about. And we say, which word would you like to take with you? Just that fact is a way of saying to the student, it's all about you. We could, uh, th uh, another variation, this is from a woman called Sheila Della originally, who many of you will have heard of or know about. She has worked for pilgrims. Uh, uh, this is the same kind of thing. At the end of a unit, get students to write down all the new words that have come up in the lesson, in the week, in the something like that. And then they have to decide whether they want to put the words in the, in the fridge, the dustbin, or the suitcase. And if they want to put the words in the dustbin, it means, do you know what? I don't particularly like this word. I never want to use it. I'm fed up with this word. And you kick it in the dustbin and you don't, it's nothing to do with you. If you put it in the fridge, it's because you've made a decision that you think this word might be useful in the future, but you're not quite sure. So you put it in the fridge to keep it fresh. But if it's a word you think you knew, you, if it's a word you think you need right now, well, put it in your suitcase and take it with you. Silly, no? Except it isn't silly. It's kind of clever. I think it's a sweet idea. And the reason it's not silly is because it doesn't say, the teacher says you must learn these words. Uh, well, th this, idea, this idea of, you know, the, 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 the 10 words, and then you get tested at the end of the week with these 10 words. Misty was talking about that this morning, I think. Uh, and, and this isn't saying that at all. This is saying, this is saying, which of these words do you want? And if you don't want some of these words, throw it away. It's all about you. What happens, what happens if... if um, Sometimes I think about pronunciation teaching. Uh, everyone knows that everyone knows uh, the pronunciation problems that Greek students have in speaking English, right? Everyone has the same problems, right? Well, of course not. I mean, I don't know what the main problems are, but you know there are one or two classic issues to do with uh, English pronunciation and Greek pronunciation, but every student has their own issue. So instead of saying to the students, I want you to practice these five words because every Greek student has a problem with these five words, or we've got people in this audience from Iran, from Turkey, from, from, from Serbia, from, from all sorts of places like that, instead of saying, you all have the same problem, why not say to the students in the same way, which words do you find most difficult to pronounce? 
and getting them to think about it. And then, of course, they can have a listen to their app and go bleep and it will say it on their app or I'll tell them how to say it. But the moment you say which words do you find difficult to pronounce, instead of telling them which words they find difficult to pronounce, you're saying it's all about you. Um, uh, I liked very much an article in, in ELT Journal in 2009 by someone called Friedman working in Japan. And he got his students to create their own dictionary, essentially. Every word that they come up with that they didn't know or they wanted to use, they had a, a wiki. Remember wikis? <laughs> Technology goes past in a flash, doesn't it? But they had a wiki, and they basically created their own lexical database, their own corpus. Well, no, it's not a corpus. That's rubbish. But uh, um, created their own collection of words and dictionaries for themselves of the words that they as a group had come up with and found and wanted to learn because the moment they did that it was all about them i've been involved recently in in um, in course writing and 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 we have a, a a section we regularly put in called explore online because until until you get students, and if you introduce anything to students, a topic, anything, to keep it in 2016 within the walls of the classroom is insane. Because I can say, it's all about you. Why don't you find out what's going on? Why don't you get involved? Because when you get involved in this topic, maybe if they go and see about the Recycled Orchestra, ask me afterwards. It's a great story with a ra rather wonderful and peculiar little sort of coder in it. The moment they go looking, they get involved. It's all about you. So the first thing we need to do if we want to try and get students thirsty is to persuade them that it's all about them. But then there's a concept that, that, uh, that, that impresses me mightily, and it impresses me more all the time I think about it. It's another metaphor for teaching. You know all about it. It's another metaphor for teaching. This is from Adrian Underhill, who many of you know for all sorts of reasons, most of which are that he must certainly have talked about pronunciation in TESOL Greece on certainly more than one occasion, I suspect. Uh, um, uh, of course, Adrian, uh, uh, renowned in many spheres and circles, but especially for his book, um, um, Sounds, Sounds what? Sound Foundations. Sound Foundations. Um, um, so the inner workbench is just a very simple metaphor for the fact that if you get students using their brains to work on language problems on their own, they're much more likely to understand, retain, and remember things than if we tell them things. If I say this is about what you do in your heads, rather than telling you what I'm going to give you to fill your heads, uh, things are going to go well. Is this revolutionary? No, of course it isn't. Uh, we've been talking about this for a long time. But what Adrian does is he gives it, to my mind, a, a clear little focus. Let me explain, uh, just, just in case uh, some of you are not familiar with this concept, the inner workbench, you know some people have a shed at the bottom of the garden and they have a workbench where they make things and they, they uh, change things and do things. He says students should have one of those in their heads. Do it yourself, we call it in in the UK, DIY, and his idea is that students should be DIY language learners, doing it themselves. Let me explain, very simple thing. Have a read of that paragraph. Can you, can you see that? Okay, well, uh, can you stand up? If you can't see it, stand up, or come and move so you can see it. Just come and move so you can see it. Uh, I'm getting out of the way. Oh, the banner. Just, just move it a little bit further. That, that's that's uh, New York College, lovely New York College. Thank you. Okay, sh just read that. Okay, now this is just a paragraph from a book of mine called The Practice of English Language Teaching, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, what Adrian suggests is that when you read this, when you read this, you're actually practicing pronunciation. Because we've got this thing called the phonic loop. 
and everyone who reads kind of reads aloud in their head. And what he says is, why not, why not, why not, maxima, why not use this incredible potential? So, for example, uh, so, for example, the sound O, as in hello. Read the paragraph again silently and see how many words you can find in that paragraph that has the sound O in them. Okay, have you done that? The sound was deafening. I could, I could almost hear you speaking. But it, it's just the most perfect example of what Adrian's talking about. Because when you're doing that, you're using your own inner workbench. You're actually doing the most fantastic pronunciation practice in silence, but it's in your own heads. And you're actually really doing good language learning and it's all about you it's not about me at all well it is i gave you the task i accept that i admit that but but it's all about you it's absolutely extraordinary uh, and we've got words like uh, goals and and goal goal and um, own and so it doesn't actually matter well um, it would matter if you were students of course we'd check it through but it doesn't really matter right now the point about it is that you were working on your own and it's all about you and you were using your cognitive abilities and you were doing the most fantastic pronunciation practice I don't know about you but I my second language is Spanish and you should hear how good my Spanish is when I speak it in my head <laughs> it's absolutely brilliant it's just it's just it's just the transition from here to here sometimes if not so good um, okay so so there we go um, uh, it's all about you and everything I do, whether it, it, especially where choice is concerned, is all about persuading you, making you even subconsciously understand that this is all about you. The second thing is, and, and, and it, I, I can't think of a better way of doing it than just, just stealing Adrian's term, is getting you to use your brains, dear students, because the moment you use your brains, not my brain, your brains, then it's still all about you. And then, of course, there's the issue about strategies, uh, because one of the things that many teachers do is try and give their students strategies to help them become better learners. Uh, what sort of strategies would you try and train your students in for listening, for example? Give me some listening strategies. How, how can you help your students become better listeners, apart from, uh, apart from uh, using um, WhatsApp? Um, that's the, the teacher from Russia. What? Tell them to close their eyes. More strategies. More strategies to become a good listener. I'm going home. <laughs> More strategies. Come on, what do you, what do you, how do you help them to become better listeners? What? Prediction. prediction. Thank you. Hooray. Prediction. What, what kind of prediction? Give me some sort of prediction things. There's micro prediction, macro prediction. What kind of things do you get them to predict? The genre. So if they know what the genre is, what can they predict? The register. The register. The words they might hear, the topic, if it's a dialogue, what, what, if it's a situational dialogue, for example, what can they predict? The, where they are what, and what kind of things people, well, this kind of stuff, you, you, you recognize this kind of stuff, here, here are a few. Um, uh, thinking about the topic, you know, so activating their schemata, I always like using that word, makes me sound good. Uh, um, uh, or what are the typical issues associated with the topic, what might they be? Or um, if it's a dialogue, what would people, people, what do people typically say when they meet each other? What do people typically say when they invite each other out? Uh, or predicting the kind of vocabulary they're likely to hear or taking notes. Of, do you train your students to do this kind of thing? Yeah, most teachers uh, try and persuade their students to do this kind of thing because there is a belief that if we can give students strategies to help them uh, become 
to help them have more ease with listening, it will help them to learn better, uh, get better at the skill. But then I've, I found myself reading some articles about this, and I just wanted to share some with you. Here's a rather nice uh, article by Jenny Kemp. It's called The Listening Log. You don't have to try and read it. Let me tell you. This is students living in an English-speaking community, and she got them to keep a little log, uh, a diary of every time they had difficulties. If they didn't understand something, they should write down when they didn't understand something. Oh, there you are, um, the WhatsApp. Yeah. Uh, if they didn't understand something, um, if they didn't understand something, then they should write down what the situation was and see if they could think of any reasons why they found it difficult to understand. Keeping a log. This is a guy called. Uh, here's a guy called um, Jeremy Cross. Very nice name. Uh, and he, um, he, he, with his Japanese students. Uh, he tried to train them in listening strategies. And at the end of it, uh, he found that the lower level Japanese students seemed to have benefited from this, whereas the slightly higher level ones, it didn't seem to make much difference. But like so much research of its type, he's only talking about eight or 10 students, so it's a very small piece of research. But, but the belief is uh, that, that by training students to do this, um, they will become better at doing it. But then I was very taken by an article by Willie Renan Dyer and Tom Farrell. Uh, uh, and it's a, actually an article about extensive listening. But have a look at this. Sorry, it's, it's, I'll stop doing this after a bit. Uh, but but, but what, what they seem to be suggesting is that they don't think strategy training is really effective. They think it, not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily work. It places a great burden on, on teachers to try and come up with training materials and activities to do it. And that actually students would be much better, they'd, they'd benefit much better from just doing more listening. It's as simple as that. Just do more listening. Well, of course, that kind of reductio ad absurdum is slightly dubious, but it suggests to me, it suggests to me, when I think of all the millions of articles that I've read about uh, strategy training, it suggests to me that, that, that this article might actually be the one to really hit the button. That instead of trying to say teach to, to students, you must learn this vocabulary. Uh, you must pronounce these words properly. You must uh, do this. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to teach you. Putting it all in the student's hands, because it's all about you, is the way to try and provoke some kind of autonomous existence. And so what she's doing in this is not saying, I have strategy training for you. Not saying I'm going to help you uh, have better learning strategies. She's saying, keep a record of every time you have difficulty with listening situations you're in. Make a note of when it is, and then my suggestion is reflect on it and think about it, and we'll talk about it and see if there's anything we can do to help you. But you see what I'm talking about. It's a completely different issue to get students to tell you how they're getting on from me trying to tell you how you should get on. And I've got things to make it easier for you. Actually, why don't we get them to say what they find difficult and move from there? Uh, but uh, something, uh, 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 Carol was talking in some detail, uh, pillar number six, seven, 23, uh, is the one about critical thinking. Uh, and I, and I, um, I, I was very taken by an article that Tessa Woodward wrote recently in a journal called The Teacher Trainer. And she talked about critical thinking, and she concentrated not on critical thinking skills, but on what she calls, or maybe I call, somebody calls, think time. This isn't a new concept. Uh, in 2003, uh, there's a, a wonderful guy called Mark Helgerson who works in Japan. And he wrote an article called, it says, Mark Helgerson invites students to talk to themselves. And his point was, one of the greatest things you can ever get students to do is to use their inner voice, to use what's in their heads, just as you did when you were doing Adrian's inner workbench thing, uh, just as people do with conversations all the time. Uh, for example, just imagine 
uh, I'm sure this has never happened to you, but just imagine that you had a row with your husband or wife. Um, uh, I'm, I, I'm just talking from ev hearsay evidence here, but, but imagine you have a row with your husband or wife. This is a disaster. A row is a disaster. It's never any good. It, there is no way that anyone ever emerges from a marital row saying, oh, I'm so pleased that happened. It just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. And what happens with most marital rows after you've been living together for 10, 15, 20 years is they just go round and round and round. Same old bloody argument all the time. The same things come up. It's just, it's just the most depressing kind of ashes in the ashtray kind of situation you can think of. But what's really interesting about marital rows is when you leave the house and get into the car, you play the dialogue all over again in your head, and then you come up with a killer line and you win the argument. <laughs> Bam! We, it's, it's true, isn't it? It's true. It's absolutely true. We, we do it all the time. We do it all the time. What? Do you, what would you do if you met, think of who would you like to meet, what would you do? Uh, Obama's going to Cuba in a, in a couple of days. If you bumped into him on the streets of New York or Havana, what would you say to him? What would you, if you met him, and we played the conversation in our heads. During the invasion of Iraq and for two or three years afterwards, I had about five and a half million conversations with Tony Blair in my head. <laughs> and one or two of them had words in them that were quite, Quite okay. Uh, and, and what I'm talking about is that, is that actually some of the best language practice and language learning students can ever have is in their own heads. And Mark Helgerson's suggestion is that we actually maximize this and we tell students about this. Of course they know, but we tell them about it. If you're sitting in a bus, you imagine that you're with a, a, an English-speaking taxi driver and you have to tell him how to get home. When you're sitting on the bus, have conversations, play conversations in your head, prepare your next class in your head. Imagine that you were having to go to, to the chemist's shop in London. Um, go to the chemist's shop in London and you had to order something. Well, then you'd have to practice Turkish or Greek, really. But no, but you're going, to, you're, go, you're, going to, you're going to order something, and so you rehearse what you're going to say. Have you ever done that in a foreign language? You rehearse what you're going to say. And crucially, maybe the biggest piece of advice any teacher trainer can ever give, and the most difficult to follow, is the one that Tessa Wood was talking about. Uh, it goes something like this. Um, uh, what, do you think of, what do you think of the refugee crisis in Greece? I mean, it's really serious, isn't it? I mean, it's really, and teachers do that all the time. They ask a question, and if there's the slightest bit of silence, my heart starts to go like this, because I don't like silence. I'm a teacher. I don't like silence. So this guy's about to formulate an answer, boom, and I interrupt him. And yet the most important moment in any lesson is, is, is the moment when, when uh, uh, so, oh, sorry, let's start again. That's... Uh, uh, don't even worry about that. Uh, the most important moment in any lesson is when teachers say, what do you think about something? And then you wait. And you let the students think. And if the students are even mildly engaged with the question or the task in hand, they will think. And when they're thinking, it's a mixture of it's all about you and Adrian's in a, in a workbench. It's a mixture of everything we're talking about. That think time may be the biggest and most important lesson any teacher trainee can ever learn. And it's the most difficult lesson for any teacher trainee, especially if they have to be observed. Because I don't know about you, but, but if you're being observed and the thing that is being observed is your teaching, the most difficult thing is not to teach. But actually, the greatest gift you can ever give students is to shut up. If you ask them or challenge them with something important, give them time to have the marital row. I've got a, I've got a brother. He's a really, really lovely man. He's, he's 11 years younger than me. Uh, he much better, he's better than me in just about every way. And he's been a teacher. He's, he's a specialist in, in teaching very advanced levels. He used to teach uh, for Cambridge proficiency. Uh, all the time and he everybody loved him i promise you everybody loved him i'd go to the schools where he worked and they'd say oh he's the best teacher in the school the bastard uh he's you know he's he's everybody, everybody absolutely loved him he was wonderful and for various reasons which i won't go into he had to stop teaching and and as a kind of he he, he and his partner um hired a camper van you know beds that kind of camper van and they went off to the south of spain because 
they thought that um, uh, A for fun and B they thought that, that the warmer weather would be better for his condition and stuff like that. So he went to the south of Spain and they had a wonderful time and uh, we'd ring every now and then and, and I rang him one day and I said, hi Philip, how are you getting on? He said, it's fantastic, you know, it's fantastic. Uh, having a really great time and we've been here, there and everywhere. And, and Philip speaks very good French, but he doesn't speak Spanish, or he didn't speak Spanish. So I said, how's your Spanish getting on? And he said, oh, Jeremy, it's amazing, he said. Do you know what I found out? He said, I found out that when I need something, like, like you know, if I need a beer or something like that, I, I, learn, I learn the Spanish for how to ask for it, and then I learn it. And I say, una caña, por favor. Isn't that fantastic? And I was on the phone saying, yeah. What's, what's so special about that? He just This is a really good teacher, a language teacher who just discovered the essential primordial fact about language teaching, that if you make people thirsty, they will drink. You know, but it had never, it's suddenly when it's applied to your own life, it's like a new revelation. So, so, um, uh, this thing, this making people thirsty, if we can create in students a need, a need for something, then they will go and get it and we will have learner autonomy because if they need something enough, they will go and get it. So the following activity I'm going to describe, I learned from a, a, a wonderful friend and colleague called Alan Pulverness because uh, I took part in the workshop in his place. What I didn't know until later was that he learned the activity from a wonderful colleague and friend called Alan Maley. And I found myself uh, doing this activity under Alan's instruction a year ago at the IATEFL conference. IATEFL is the International Association of Teachers. Oh, um, okay, so I find myself doing that. It goes like this, it goes like this. Uh, here's a poem. It's one of my favorite poems in the whole world. Uh, just have a read. And the poem is called Midsummer Tobago, and it's by the Trinidadian poet Derek Walcott. Now, if I were Alan Maley, by the way, I've done this activity with students of various ages and levels. I've been a participant, as I've suggested, in this activity twice, and I've done it with lots and lots of groups of teachers. What Alan and I have said when I've talked to him about it, because I acknowledge his brilliance in this is that I have never seen it fail, either as a participant or as a, or as a uh, leader. So the instruction is perfectly simple. And ideally, I'd put you in groups of about six or seven people. Uh, and probably each group would get a different poem, who knows, but that's neither here nor there. The instruction is perfectly simple. In 20 to 25 minutes, you have to perform this poem to the rest of the class, or this audience, or whatever. We don't have time to do it, so you'll have to believe me. And he'll back me up. It works, I promise. Um, you have, in 20 to 25 minutes, you have to perform this lesson to the rest of the group. I don't care how you do it. You can do it in chorus. You can do it word for word. One person can speak the poem and the others can do something else. I don't care how you do it. You can do it any which way you like. You can do it standing down, sitting up. You can lie on the floor. You can stand on the table. You can take all your clothes off. You can do whatever you want. I don't care. The only thing you have to do is perform this poem to the rest of the class. Oh, and there's one condition. Every single member of the group must take part. And all I can tell you, both as a participant and as an organizer of this activity, which I have now taken up with a rather kind of almost sort of juvenile uh, enthusiasm, it's absolutely sensational. I have never seen a group not commit to it 100%. That's a lie. We've had a few 70, 60%, I bet. I have never seen a group that doesn't commit to this activity. Everyone takes part. It's absolutely extraordinary with a, with a mixture of seriousness and playfulness, which is quite unlike anything I know from many, many activities. And the beauty of it, of course, is, is that in so doing, they have to understand the poem. They have to say the words again and again and again. They have to understand the words, work with the words, think about what the words mean and all sorts of things like that. It's absolutely extraordinary as an activity, but, but even if you don't particularly like the activity, it stands as a perfect metaphor 
for what we're talking about. Because by organizing that activity, you create a need that the students, unless they are having a seriously bad day, have to respond to the need. There's no alternative but to respond to the need. Uh, here's a, a photograph of, of um, a group of Cuban teachers nine days ago in Havana. This is them doing this poem. There they are. This is a group of serious people like you. <laughs> but they did it with absolute commitment. And, and, and here is, here's, here's, and they broke my heart, these two. Yeah, she's drowsing. And then, and then this is the way they did it. And then at the end when it says, days I have held, days I have lost, Days that outgrow like daughters, my harboring arms. And the girl on the floor just got up and the other one reached for her and she just walked away. And I, I don't know about you, I'm a bit, bit sentimental really. I just, it made me cry, it was wonderful. This need, this need um, is answered by that one activity. But of course there's someone who wants to take this a lot further. And his name of course is Sugata Mitra. Uh, Sugata Mitra, uh, became famous, uh, uh, many of you know who he is, but he became famous for an experiment called the hole in the wall experiment. If you remember very quickly, he put a computer in a wall in a slum in New Delhi at the height of children, not at the height of adults. And he left them to it, the language which was not theirs. And within almost no time at all, so the story goes, uh, the kids were using the computer, completely comfortable with the computer. No one had told them how to switch it on, how to switch it off. They started doing things like downloading uh, antivirus software. They were just really, really good at using this computer all on their own with no instruction whatsoever. And he built that up into a suggestion that actually we don't really need teachers at all. Uh, because what he talks about is we should organize uh, students in souls self-organized learning environments, a bit like Alan's poem activity, only he uses technology. And he used to work for a software company, so that, just put that to one side. Uh, but, but in self-organized learning environments, all I have to do is provoke the need and then leave you to it. And you will learn on your own. Because his belief is not in teaching, his belief is in what he calls minimally invasive education. The less the teacher invades the education business, the better. So what he suggests is that all we need to do with students is to give them the right kind of need, put them in little groups, connect them to the internet, and they'll do it all themselves. That's all. You don't need to do anything else. You ask them big questions, like if they're kids, you ask them questions like, do humans have a soul? Uh, and, and leave them to it. You ask them, what is DNA? And leave them to it. Why do men have mustaches and women don't? Uh, usually, uh, um, and, and, you know, and you just, and you just, and you just leave them to it. You just leave them to it because in a self-organized learning environment, in a self-organized learning environment, they will do the learning themselves without my help, autonomously. And all I've done is turn them on. Now, for those of you who were at the IATFL conference two years ago, IATFL is the International Association of... Oh, okay, for those of you who were at the IATFL conference two years ago, he gave the closing plenary. And of all the IATFL plenaries I have listened to in my life, and that's a really lot, a lot, a lot of IATFL plenaries, none has ever done what he did. Absolutely extraordinary. At the end of his plenary, half the audience stood up and cheered him to the echo, their hearts full of emotion and joy at what he'd said. And the other half of the audience sat on their hands and you could see the smoke coming out of their ears. And many of you in this room were involved in what happened in the next few weeks. A heated, I mean a really passionate, heated, sometimes angry, sometimes measured, sometimes not, debate erupted all over social media, on blogs, everywhere. An absolute firestorm of argument about teaching and learning which makes me say that it's probably the most successful plenary talk there has ever been, because it provoked this level of, of, of absolute passion. Why? Well, because for the people, by the way, in his defense, not that he needs any, he's a consummately comfortable person and a brilliant speaker. 
In his defense, what he was trying to suggest is that in a country like India, where the provision of education is so variable, and where some of the teaching is really bad and some kids don't have any teachers at all, if you could just hook kids up to a computer, to the internet, and give them the right questions to ask, you would remove educational disadvantage at a stroke. Revolution, right? By the way, a country like Uruguay, population 3.5 million, they have something called the Plan Sebel. I don't know if you know about Plan Sebel, but every single child in Uruguay has a free laptop computer designed especially for them. They're so small that my hands can't use the keys because I've got fat old ones. And every kid is within less than 300 meters from uh, free broadband, which works most of the time. Uh, so this idea that somehow, to come back to adaptive learning, uh, technology is going to create Volvo, Volvo, where's Misty gone? V v revolution. It's going to get the wheel turning round and round. Hi, Miss. It's turn get the world turning, the get the wheel turning round and round and round. Is 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 one that is prevalent. Uh, we're all worried about AI. Did you see Ex Machina? Does anyone see Ex Machina, the film? Do you see it? Uh, we're all doomed, by the way. We're all doomed. No T cell grease next year, and no human beings the year after. It's absolutely terrible. We're finished. And and um. So, so basically, he, he, the suggestion here, he says, I'm not saying the education system is broken. It's not broken. It's just that we don't need it anymore. It's outdated. Of course, he's referring specifically to the colonial education of the British Empire. He talks about that a lot. Hence, what you've got there on the, on the, on the, on the screen. Does this have any relevance for English language teaching? Because the questions I said to you were about DNA, about souls, about moustaches, about that kind of thing. It's a big question. No one's, ever, no one's ever tried to work out how it would work with, with English language teaching. Oh, wait a minute, that's not true. Someone has. In a school called International House in London, they ran an experiment. The director of studies, a woman called Verinda Unlu, ran an experiment. Talked to Sugata Mitra, she talked to various people, and she said, let's give it a go. And so for four weeks, with 18 students between levels A1 to B2, the students were involved in absolutely 100% classic Sugata Mitra uh, um, methodology, though that's not the right word. How did it work? Well, how did it work? Well, each day, 18 students were given a question. The teacher did a sort of lead-in to get them in the mood, you know, and sort of get them excited. And then uh, uh, the teacher left the room and left them alone for 40 to 50 minutes, just as Alan did with us when I did the poetry activity with him, though it wasn't 40 to 45 minutes. The difference is these students are hooked up to the internet. So some of the questions they asked worked and some of them didn't, but the ones who worked, the ones that worked were questions like, how do people learn languages? That's the question, I'll leave you to it. Here's the computer. Anything you want. There are books on the walls and here's the computer. I'll be back in 50 minutes. Your group has to make a presentation to the rest of the class explaining what you found and what you think. Uh, notice the teacher set the question, leaves the room and then gives praise and watches and, and, and so on. That's it. That's it. That's it. Uh, here, here are some of the students working away doing this activity. At the end, by the way, in brackets, Sugata Mitra says, and this is a challenge, Sugata Mitra says, you don't need a qualified teacher. You really don't. Anyone will do. Any adult who's just basically empathetic and sort of nice will do. Because all the teacher's doing there was sort of giving praise and, and encouragement and stuff like that. And there they are, working away. Now, what the International House people say at the end of the, by the way, of the 18 students, one student couldn't take it and dropped out. But one student out of 18 in a private language school, that's not so bad. We've all had dropouts sometimes uh, worse than that. Uh, what they say at International House is they can't say whether the students' uh, language knowledge, knowledge underlined, got better. But what they can say, hand on heart, there's no research statistics, but they can say hand on heart, what they can say is that every single student became more fluent in four weeks than they were when they started, even including 
some of the students who were quite low level and could hardly say anything at the beginning. By the end, they could say things. And that makes me wonder where we're going. By the way, is this, uh, is this I'm gonna, I've got about another few minutes to go and I'm nearly finished. Is this, is this, is, is this, is this new and radical? Is it evolution, revolution, or is it Mr. Wheel like the great Mandela? turning round and round, and we've just sort of come, we completed the cycle and we're starting again. I wonder about that. Last weekend, I was at TESOL, Spain, and I was on a panel talking about the difference between CLIL and general English. Uh, and um, and uh, one guy, Phil Ball, who's, who's co-written a book about CLIL, this is what he said. If you want your students to learn English, don't teach language. It's rather like it's rather like, who was that guy on the stage last year at Tissot Greece? Mm, Steve Krashen, isn't it? It's a bit like Steve Krashen saying, you know, you don't teach the stuff, you get them to read a lot and read engaging and challenging stuff. So this is not exactly a new idea. I'd go back even further. Uh, here's a, here, what about this? Is Dick all right? You know this famous quote. I quote it all the time because it's one of the great sort of founding quotes in my mind, though not at the time, for the whole kind of communicative activity movement. It says, if the language teacher's management activities are directed exclusively at involving the learners in solving communication problems in the target language, then language learning will take care of itself. So this great... Uh, 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 this great revolution that Sugata Mitra is ushering in, uh, it comes from a tradition. It is not new. It comes from a tradition of thought, which has always been there. What he's done to bring us back to the beginning of this talk is to marry it to what the world is like now, which Dick Allwright in those days could never have imagined, because I couldn't, and I'm at least as intelligent as... Oh, no, I'm not. Uh, but none of us could have imagined in 1979 that we would live in the world we live in now. Where, where if I want to see if there's anything I'm saying now which is wrong, I can check it on my phone right now, no problem. Um, so, with all of this, how do we get students to learn on their own? That's what we want to do. Maybe everything we've been doing actually gets in the way of that, and we should just follow Sugata or Dick Allwright's hypothesis or, and just stop it and just create the need and let students get on with it, maybe. That's the question that this plenary, I hope, will leave in your heads because I don't quite know the answer. I do sort of think, I do sort of think, wait a minute, wait a minute, what do teachers have to offer? Well, I know that the internet knows everything, but actually teachers know things too. We know things. What do we know? Well, hopefully we know the English language. Hopefully we know something about it so we can explain it, though of course, trying to explain a language is absolutely impossible. Misty's brilliant explanations of compound words this morning worked absolutely fine. It's a bit like, we, I can explain the present simple without even opening my eyes or thinking about it. But some other reaches of English grammar are significantly more difficult to pin down. People do MAs and PhDs about one little item of grammar. So how we think, anyway, but we do know stuff. We know about the language. We know about classrooms and what they're like. We know what happens if we do this. We know how students generally behave if we do that. We know what they're, we know what they're, thank you. We know what, we know what, what, we know stuff. And the idea that somehow that knowledge should be replaced by a completely, uh, um, a completely free-for-all knowledge out there on the internet, some of which is not necessarily that reliable and doesn't necessarily come with the care and empathy that a good teacher brings with that knowledge, that worries me considerably. Uh, one thing teachers can do is to provide incentive and content. Now, you may say that, that Sugata Mitra and people like that, or certainly the PERM activity, does exactly that. Uh, so in that sense, maybe both that poetry activity and the Sugata Mitra kind of stuff uh, fits perfectly with, with my own understanding of what, what teachers can bring and what teachers do. Uh, um, 
But I think one of the things teachers can do, and I don't think you do this just through questions, I think you do this through a whole lot of professional skills and abilities and experience and passion and involvement and interest. I mean, when we looked at the primary stuff in, in the creativity uh, panel this morning, you just knew that was there. And I'm not sure that can be replicated by just getting students to hook into uh, knowledge on the internet. By the way, I'm a complete technophile. I use the internet every single day of my life. The stuff you were doing with WhatsApp and your colleague from Serbia, who was, uh, no, from, from Turkey. No, from, uh, who was the other WhatsApp person? Uh, the post, a lovely poster. One of them was doing it for writing and the other was getting students to listen. Uh, you were doing the listening stuff. And then, the, the, oh, sorry, from Iran. I'm terribly sorry. The woman from Iran who was, there she is. Uh, hello. The, and, and they were both, if they're wonderful posters, go and have a look at the poster presentation. They're using WhatsApp to get students to interact and do stuff. Uh, isn't that wonderful that you can do that? But the point is, they're doing it, they're guiding it, they're, they're structuring it, they're motivating, they're motivating their students to take part. I think that's what we do. That's one of the things we do as teachers. Uh, um, and the one thing we can do, and, and this is what I have found out with music teachers, when I've had music teachers, is the one thing teachers can do that, that, that all these free activities aren't so good at doing is pinpointing errors understanding where the weaknesses are, trying to help you over humps and weaknesses, trying to help you see what's going wrong here and what's going right there. And that's what teachers do. And software doesn't do that in the same way, at least not yet, as far as I can see. Uh, and of course, teachers, teachers can guide and teachers can, can, can scaffold. Uh, teachers can scaffold. Thank you. That's just what I said. There we are. So, so what I've tried to do in this plenary um, is to say that, of course, students can learn by themselves. Of course, one of the great achievements we could have if we were good enough is to help students take more and more responsibility for their own learning and turn them on to places where they can find what they need to become better at English or any other subject. I've suggested that indeed we live in a world where technology can help us enormously in this, but I don't think it is the answer yet uh, for what we're talking about. So what we do instead is we, we do everything we can uh, to try and, and make students thirsty. I can't think of a better image, to make students thirsty. So they try and get they're desperate to get what it is we want them to get. And that's when they start to become autonomous. But I believe profoundly, and I suppose I would say this, because otherwise what's the point of me or you or anybody? I believe profoundly that we have a role in this, not only to try and persuade you to take responsibility for your learning, but also to help you and to bring our professional expertise to bear on this. And so just as Misty this morning uh, gave us a number of stories, I'd like to end with a story uh, about teachers. Um, I want to go back to, to uh, it clearly has died on me, this stupid thing. I want to go back to Cuba. Uh, um, because last year, I was there again for two weeks just the other day, but last year, they wanted to take me to the Museo de la Campagna de Alphabetización which would translate, it's, it's the Museum of the, Campe the Literacy Campaign. They said, Jeremy, Jeremy, we want to take you to the Literacy Museum. And I don't know about you, but my enthusiasm instantly skyrocketed. A Literacy Museum? Can you, I mean, what do you get? It just, I'm, to be honest, I was most unenthusiastic and I would have got out of it if I could. Um, I mean, if they wanted to take me to the Museum of the Revolution, I could understand that but a literacy museum, but I had no choice. I had to go along. And it's the, the literacy museum is in the, is in the Campo Escolar, which is the, the, uh, the school, um, oh, it doesn't matter. Anyway, the, here's the museum. As you can see, like so many things in Cuba, this doesn't look like the greatest museum you've ever seen. It's a bungalow. It's got about five rooms. The walls are kind of off-white and they need repainting. The, the exhibits are in glass cases which are dusty and they're very small. I was met at the entrance by the directora, the director of the uh, museum, a woman of about my age who looked at me with great suspiciousness and she said, ¿Quién es el gringo? In other words, who's that? 
you know, because what I, for all she knew, I was coming, I was a counter-revolutionary. I don't know. Does anyone she, but they said, it's all right, he's Jeremy, he's interested, and he speaks Spanish, so you'll be all right, blah, blah, blah. And then we went. We went into the museum. And I'm now going to tell you uh, what I found there, some of what I found there. Um, in the hall, there's this great big picture of Fidel Castro. Now, in order to understand this story, I have to say this to you. This story works fine whether you think Fidel was a saint or a devil whether you think communism is the worst spawn of human evil or the greatest political system there's ever been, whether you think Fidel was the most charismatic leader in the history of the world or the biggest fool or idiot there's ever been, this story works whatever you think of the system and of Fidel. Here he was at the United Nations in 1961 giving one of his little speeches. This one went on for only four and a half hours. Uh, he did that, he did that. He was an extra... Anyway, so there he is, and he's, he's going, uh, wave, wagging his finger at the rest of the world. And he said, uh, Cuba, Cuba será el primer país en América que puede ser la vuelta de uno meses que, que no tiene ni un solo analfabeto. Cuba will be able to say in, it, it, that it's the, just after a few months that it's the only country in America that doesn't have a single illiterate person. Cuba, 1961. Most of the island has no power, no electricity. In the interior, it's primitive. It still is pretty primitive for other reasons. But anyway, no power, nothing. They had nothing. And the vast majority of the country were illiterate. The vast majority of the country, except for the people, the sort of higher echelons, couldn't read and they couldn't write. And Fidel said, we're going to teach everyone to read and write. Come with me. Come on, people. Come on. Go to the island. Go to, go to the campesinos. Go to the peasants and teach them how to read and write so that we can say to the rest of the world, because he's like that, we, we can say to the rest of the world, we don't have a single illiterate person. And they answered his call in their hundreds of thousands. Off they went, and they were all, most of them were young, and most of them, funnily enough, about 80% of them were young girls. And there they go. They gave them berries and the special trousers, and they sent them off to volunteer as volunteers, no money in this, to volunteer to teach Cubans how to read and write. It was absolutely extraordinary. They went all over the island. It was absolutely extraordinary. There they are. And they gave them one particular thing. They gave them el farol, the light. You know, the communist Fidel, he's really good at propaganda, this guy, really good. They gave him the light. Why? Because if you're going to teach peasants how to read and write, you can only do it when they come in from the fields. And by the time they come in from the fields, it's dark. So they need a light. But it's not just that. You're giving them the light of knowledge, of education. And they went. And these kids, these kids, they went into the peasants' houses. They went into villagers' houses. They went into villagers' houses. And they taught people how to read and write. Uh, three weeks ago, uh, almost to the day, um, I had lunch with these two people in Havana. Now, I could tell you lots about him. He's really interesting. He was the head of military intelligence at the Cuban embassy in Chile in 1973 when the coup happened against Allende. But actually, he's not the person who's interesting in this photo. She is. She's Rita. And Rita was a volunteer in the literary campaign when she was 11 years old. She went and taught grown-ups how to read and write at the age of 11. And to this day, she says, it's the best thing I have ever done. And at the end of a year, Rita, along with thousands of other kids, poured into Revolution Square. And they poured into Revolution Square with their banners. And look, see the girl on the top right? She hasn't got an AK-47 or a rifle. She's got a cardboard pencil. These guys know how to do propaganda. She's got a, and Rita walked into the square, she told me, with a cardboard pencil, which was probably about three times her size. And they walked into the square and they said, Fidel, Fidel, dinos que otra cosa tenemos que hacer. What other things do you want us to do, Fidel? What other things do you want us to do? And he stood there at the microphone and he boomed, his voice boomed out and he said, Estudia, 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 study, study, study. Now, I don't know about you, and let me say once again, I don't care whether you think he's a saint or a devil, but the mobilization of the youth of a country to educate people to be better, it's probably the most beautiful educational story I've ever heard. Absolutely beautiful. They did it. They actually did it. They taught the entire island to read and write. And then they came into the square full of this pride at what they'd done. Absolutely extraordinary. 
If you ask Cubans today whether the youth of Cuba today would behave in the same way, they say yes, but their eyes are unconvincing because things have changed and things may change dramatically fairly soon, but that's another story. So that's the story of one of the great educational achievements I know of my life, uh, in my lifetime, and uh, not my life, in my lifetime. But of course, it's not all like that because the story had a slightly darker element too. Because uh, in 1961, there were still counter-revolutionaries, there were still people who wanted to get rid of Fidel and Che and all these people. And so all over Cuba, there were fights and skirmishes to see if the revolution could be uh, um, defeated and so on and so forth. And one of the things they did, one of the things they did is they, they'd go and kill these volunteers. Because that was a, it was a bit like, by the way, you know, poor old Turkey, those of you from Turkey, not again today, all over again, another bloody bomb. Anyway, uh, so, so, um, so, so one of the ways you make your point is by killing people, by killing people. So they killed some of these, these volunteers. They killed some of these volunteers. And at the very moment that, uh, that Rita uh, was teaching, at the age of 11, someone to read and write, um, uh, a young man called Manuel Asconce Domenech, he's the guy on the top, I think he's so beautiful with his serious face and his beautiful mouth and his eyes, was teaching, uh, was teaching um, the family of, of Pedro Lantigua to read and write. And one night, while they were working, uh, um, the bandidos, the counter-revolutionaries, burst in. They burst in the house, they smashed down the door, and they shot Pedro Lantigua dead. And then they turned to the woman, and they said, ¿Y quién es eso? ¿Quién es eso? ¿Quién es? Who's, the, who's the boy? Who's the young boy? And the wife, in order to, to desperately to try and protect this boy's life, she said, pues, es mi hijo. Es mi, he's my son. He's my son. And Manuel Asconce Domenech, this is the story the director told me, even though he knew what risk he was running, even though he knew what perilous danger he was in, but filled with the orgullo, the pride of having answered Fidel's call, and filled with the pride of having done this extraordinary thing, this thing of educating someone, this extraordinary gift, something he'd never imagined. He looked the gunman in the face and he said, no, no soy el hijo, he said. Yo soy el maestro, I'm the teacher, and they shot him dead. And to this day, when you start your teacher training course at the Universidad Pedagogica, sometimes, you get a t-shirt and on the back it says, Yo soy el maestro. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, thank, you. thank you very much.